the image of God. I am made in the image of God. So I'm quite busy this week. My wife is working at least two days this week and she's a nurse. When she works, she works 12 hour shifts and which means I have to stay with the kids all day long. No time to get anything done. Plus I have to prepare the message for Sabbath. I have a couple of meetings to attend like Zoom meetings and I have a, just a lot on my plate. So what I'm trying to do today is this. I need to go down to Baltimore City, try to prepare the message but I also need to get my workout in. I have no time to work out anymore. So I'm gonna try to do both today and uh, see how that's gonna go. Wait, 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 I almost forgot. Should Christians participate in demonstrations and protests like the one for George Floyd? Let's find out. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. So, I believe the Bible can help us to answer this question. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. In the first place, Jesus only told the story because one of the lawyers, one of the experts of the law, was trying to catch Jesus into a gotcha question. And his question was, Lord Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus went on to tell him the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you guys mind if I contemporize this parable just a little bit? I mean, I believe if this parable were to be told today, it would be told a little bit different. Let's just say, imagine that this man from, from the suburbs is, is leaving his work late at night, he's on his way home and he's overtaken by criminals. They beat him, they rob him, and they leave him for dead or like on the side of the street. And then he spends all night long on the street side begging for his life. Early morning, this young, white Christian professional is on his way to work and he sees this man like left for dead. He's begging, help me please, help me. He thinks, oh my goodness, I'm too late for my meeting. I gotta go. Someone else has gotta help him. Just a few minutes later, this black young professional up and coming, loads of money. I mean, this guy is doing very well financially. Is on his way to work in the early morning. He sees the same man on the street begging, help me please, he thinks. This guy is drunk. He made terrible choices. He thinks, you better make the right choices like I made. I'm doing very well and you were not because of your choices. And he just goes on with his life, doesn't even think about helping the man. Then, just only a few minutes later, this, this black man from the hood is coming down the street. He says, this man, help me please, help me. He doesn't even think twice. He gets down, helps the guy, asks him, what is going on, man? Did the bad guys get you? He calls 911, the police come, takes the man to the hospital, and later that day, and sometime during that week, this black man from the hood with sagging pants and tattoos all over his body goes back to check on him at the hospital. And he says, hey man, how you're doing? You are my brother, no matter what. The point that Jesus was making with this parable, that we all, brothers and sisters, we all are neighbors and you must take care of each other regardless of our race, regardless of your background, regardless of anything. George Floyd was not the only one pinned down to the ground. He represents thousands if not millions of people around America and around the world who suffered discrimination, abuse of power. Now, one thing is when people are actually fighting the police. One thing is when people are pulling guns and, and drawing for weapons and they're actually in that physical combat with the police. Police officers have to defend themselves. You would do the same if anyone were to attack you. You would defend yourself. But in the case of George Floyd, he was handcuffed, he was 
pinned to the ground and this guy had his knee on his neck for a very long period of time. What danger did he represent? What could he do with his hands handcuffed to his back and his stomach pinned down to the ground? I mean, obviously he could not do anything. He did not represent any harm or threat to the lives of those officers. That's why this is so aggravating. That's why this is so heartbreaking. A man pinned to the ground being killed by an officer? This is infuriating. But the real question is this. Why do we only rebel against evil when it strikes us in the face, when it becomes personal? What if it were not George Floyd pinned to the ground? What if his name was like John Smith or Bradley McConnell? What if he were white? Would it make you more aggravated? But let me ask you another question. What if it were you pinned to the ground saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe? Would you want anybody ever to defend you? Would you want anybody ever to stand up after you did to tell everyone how unjust your killing was? That puts the whole perspective in a whole new level. Anyways, enough talk. Let's just get some workout done. Okay. Let's go ride some bike. Whoa. In Baltimore City. So since this whole thing began, a lot of people are asking questions like honest, sincere questions. Pastor, should we even get involved in demonstrations and, and protests like this? I mean, what is going on? What is our role? Somebody sent, sent me this message here. I wanna read this to you here. This is a text from Ellen White. I'm reading from Desire of Ages, page 509. I'm gonna send the link right here in the description. If you're watching this video on YouTube, just go down and you will see that on the description. And this is what she says, the government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reform. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from the earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of man, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach man individually and must regenerate the heart. The Tsar of Ages, page 509. If we read just this text alone, we would think that Ellen White was saying that, you know what, we should be aloof, we should not be getting involved in civil matters and stay away from it because we should only focus on eternal things. But that's not the only thing she wrote. Besides, the context in which she's writing about, she's writing a context of Phariseeism or legalism or fanaticism. The religious leaders, and they were the same as civil leaders of those times, they created so many rules, so many regulations that kept people away from God that made things very, very hard. But that's not the only thing she wrote about civil unrest or getting involved with civil authorities. In 1899, Ellen White wrote a letter to H.W. Kellogg. She was requesting for the rights of the Gospel Minister, a book that was written at the time. She wanted to use the proceeds to invest in the work in the South. She was saying that the work in the South, primarily also with the black folk, was being neglected. And, and there were a lot of folks that were not doing anything about it. And God was telling her, a work must be done in the South and she was burdened by that. A lot of people refused to do anything. The work in the South was crucial. The slaves, they were actually free. They was post-Civil War, but they were not really free indeed. They still had a slave mentality. They were uneducated and nobody was willing to educate them. Their situation was really hard. And then she wrote this. Look what she says. 
The desire to show their masterly authority over the black is still burning in the hearts of many who claim to be Christians, but whose lives declare that they are standing under the black banner of great apostates. When the whites commit crimes, they are often allowed to go uncondemned, while for the same transgressions the blacks, ignorant, debased, knowing nothing of the word of God, and scarcely knowing their right hand from the left, are treated worse than the brutes. The demons of passion is let loose, and all suffering that can be devised is instituted against them. Will not God judge for these things? As surely as the whites have brought their inhumane cruelty to bear upon Negroes, so surely will God's vengeance fall upon them. God is cognizant of the means of which mission fields have been robbed, and He has written in all His book. Years that might have been spent in educating the colored people have been lost, and this neglect testifies against all Christendom, and especially against those who have been entrusted with the last message of warning to be given to the world. May the Lord help His people to see where they have been unfaithful stewards. Wow. She's talking about slavery issues, discrimination, in a context of preaching the three angels' messages, where all people from all tribes should bow down and worship their Creator. We all made in the image of God. So this text makes quite clear where Ellen White stood in regards to slavery and the situation of the Negroes. She was specifically saying that the special work should be done because of their situation. She was not favoring their lives over others. She was simply stating because of the situation they lived in, they deserved special attention. But that's not all. There is more. Now, this context, Ellen White is talking about right after the General Conference of 1888. That was a very fateful, sad General Conference. The church was taking the wrong turn, going to a very legalistic way in which people forget completely the grace of God. And those who believe that the grace of God is really the most important thing, that we only saved by the grace of Jesus, were considered to be like weak or unfaithful Christians. So yes, the church drop the ball. And in this manuscript, in this letter, Ellen White is addressing precisely what was happening in those days, that some people that love the grace of God were trying to speak up and were being pretty much gagged by a huge majority. So this is a manuscript release, volume 11, page 229. The link will be down below the description. This is what she says. I was confirmed in all I had stated in Minneapolis, that a reformation must go through the churches. Reforms must be made, for a spiritual weakness and blindness were upon the people who had been blessed with great light and precious opportunities and privileges. As reformers, they had come out of the denomination churches, but they now act as part similar to that which the churches acted. While we will endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace, we will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry. Do you catch that? She says, we will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry. Again, the link is down in the description so you can see for yourself. So if she were willing to say something about this concerning people who are being legalistic and fanaticals in the faith, how much more we should be willing to say that we must speak and defend those that right now cannot defend themselves. In Proverbs 31 verse 8 and 9 we find this, they speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, they speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. So, I mean, what part of speak up for those who cannot defend themselves we do not get? So, but here's the point. If we have to speak for those who cannot defend themselves, there's got to be a God-glorifying way to do so. So, our country is under a lot of distress right now. Demonstrations have become riots protests have become looting and a lot of people are destroying property 
killing each other because of what happened to George Floyd and others. The other day, somebody sent me a picture of Jesus turning over the tables in the temple. He was saying this, you know, destruction of private property. Now I understand, as if it was excusable to destroy private property because Jesus, 2,000 years ago, turned the tables. It is the same Jesus who says, if you live by the sword, you shall die by the sword. It is the same Jesus that said, and by this you shall know you my disciples, if you love one another. And, and Paul said in Romans 12, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God. So we have to understand Jesus from the whole bigger picture, not just one incident. By the way, whatever happened to blessed are the peacemakers. When I was a third grader, I had a friend called Daniel. And uh, there were boys from the fourth grade who loved picking on us. And especially me, I was always a little guy. So I remember one day very, very clearly, this boy came to me and he was trying to hit me and trying to, to hurt me. And I really could not defend myself. On that day, Daniel, my friend, he was taller and stronger. He took that boy from the fourth grade, threw him in the ground and hurt him. He started beating him and took his face and was like pushing against the sand. On that day, Daniel defended me very well. From that day forward, that boy never, ever, ever messed with me again. But that was not the only thing that happened on that day. The real enemy was not that bully. The real enemy was bullying. And on that day, Daniel went a little bit overboard. He did a little bit extra. He did not want him to defend me. Now he was hurting the boy. So I was being bullied and I was being defended by Daniel. But by doing that, Daniel himself became the bully. The real enemy was bullying. And on that day, bullying had won the day. It has just changed the character. If you understand for justice, you better know what justice stands for. Don't drag the banner of justice in the dirt of more injustice and violence. It's not gonna help. Let me put this way. Let's say I hit you in the face. And then because I hit you in the face, you go out, go home, go back to your neighborhood, and you, you slash everyone else's tires out. It's just all your neighbor's tires are, are slashed. How is that fair? How are you making that right? I slap you in the face so you retaliate against everybody else. How do we expect to find healing in the name of Jesus if we become the demons we're trying to exercise? What we need is a God-given perspective. And I think I know the perfect place for that. So the Bible is quite clear in giving us this God-given perspective, yes. Jesus is coming very soon. Yes, we gotta be ready, especially after the events of 2020. Guys, you gotta get ready. Jesus is coming and very, very soon. But just like the disciples, we forget what we ought to be doing before He comes. We get so bogged down by the details and the signs that we forgot that Jesus told us that we must be doing things until He comes. As a matter of fact, I want you to get this. We ought to be living today as if Jesus were already here. He told us to bring His kingdom into this world. Don't we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you and I should be living our lives as if our Lord was already here. So when we see acts of injustice, when we see people, regardless of their color skin, suffering discrimination, we ought to stand up. We have to speak for them because if they can't defend themselves, who? He's going to speak for them until Jesus comes. When Jesus comes, yes, He will fix everything. He will judge fairly. But until then, who is going to stand up for them? The Bible says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has shown you, all men, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Dr. King once said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What happened to George Floyd? What happened to Breonna Taylor? What happened to so many others? It's unjust, but there is nothing you and I can do to bring them back. Jesus got that. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, He will bring people back. He will judge fairly and justly. But until then, there are things that you and I can do and should do. So things like this will never happen again with anyone else, regardless of the color of their skin. Yes, we can speak against violence. We can and should speak against racism, about racial profiling, but we ought to do this in a way that will glorify God and not hurt other people. I say this again, how we can overcome this problem if we become the demons we're trying to exercise? If we ought to protest and demonstrate, we ought to, but let us do it in a way that will glorify God and not hurt anyone else 
chaos around us. Destroying someone else's property and looting or rioting, it is not the solution. This will not glorify God. It will not help anyone else. It would only make it worse. We have thousands of protesters who are doing the right thing. They're peacefully protesting and demonstrating and calling for the right acts upon what is happening in our country today. You can also do that, but if you do not want to go out and protest, you don't have to. You can use social media, you can talk to your friends and neighbors, you can still just make sure that no one else around you, that you will not discriminate against anyone, that we respect and love every life, every human life, because we all made in the image of God. We can ask questions, we can speak to people who suffer discrimination and listen carefully. Just listen to their stories and their pleas. And don't forget that above all things and everything else, it is love. It is by the way we love one another that they will know we are truly the disciples of Jesus. And don't forget, you and I are made in the image of God. God bless you. my vlog man okay. you can if you want to man yeah <laughs> you gonna say hello man yeah what's your name hello I'm Tavion Adams cool man Tavion Adams hey I'm Diego man nice to meet you man subscribe and yeah yep, yep, enjoy yep. thank you man thank you go, thank go. you yeah subscribe man Diego Boker that's yeah. me man my right. next, last name is hard but Diego Boker on YouTube that's it so uh, th th what right now I'm doing for my church I'm a pastor and I'm pretty much shooting for the what happened to George Floyd and the racial oh, issues wow. and things like this. I was at the yeah. protest. Yeah. Me Were and my you? church. Yeah. yeah cool. Which church you go to? Uh, Christian Revival Center. Uh, I appreciate it because, yeah. you know, like as young black people, like sometimes we feel like people don't listen or hear us. And even in the Christian community, when there's such a tear between, oh, you know, stay silent, stay in your closet and pray. And then there's a hmm. group of people that is like, no, you got to speak out. God oh, will. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But you guys are young. I mean, you guys are what, 20 something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. man. Come on. Man. <laughs> you said I can see. Yeah, yeah. You guys go for it, man. You guys have a beautiful life ahead of you. Vibrant life. Keep up doing what you're doing. Thank God you. will bless you. you will. How long you've been vlogging and what the? Oh, uh, vlogging literally just about a couple of weeks. Like literally, wow. I just started this since this whole thing started. Perfect. I can reach a whole other other people. Right. Can I, can I pray with you guys? Yeah. yeah. I All love right. Prayer. All right. Lord, I wanna thank you so much for me. These young people here, Lord, I, they have their beautiful life ahead of them. I just pray, Lord, you will bless them with your Holy Spirit, with future great hope. Lord, I pray you will protect them from from crimes outside, from trouble. Just put your angels around these young people that it will make a difference, not only today, but in the future. Amen. 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 What thank denomination you. are you? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, okay, cool. Have you heard of us? Yes, yeah. my aunt is Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, is she? Yeah, yeah. Where, where is she at? She was in New York. <laughs> New York, gotcha. Yeah. There's a lot of Adventists there. Yes, yeah, there yes. Yeah. We're all together. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. One Absolutely. body. Yes. One Jesus body, one Christ. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you guys, thank you so much, guys. Of course, thanks for guys letting us crash. Hey, sure, man, come on, man. I'm going to put this. Hey, you, you watch out. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm going to put you guys on this. You guys